Hey everybody, hope you've had a great week. Uh, it's been another super fun week in the land of low friction. So today I'm just going to be covering off a little bit uh, still from last week's topic and then we're going to be going into what is the wildest sentence I think I've ever read uh, in the chain wear space. Uh, so I want to uh, have a, yeah, a, a bit of an initial exploration into that and I'm going to be Everything might be a little bit rushed because, yeah, school holidays, I've got a mini-me and uh, his friend's over today, so I've got to balance, um, yeah, looking after some terrors in amongst recording and in amongst other work, so it's going to be uh, fun. Hopefully I won't be too disjointed and all over the place. Let's see how we go. All right, let's get into it. All right, so on the production tool, basically at dot number five, which you can see where my cursor is now, that is the line that they have drawn on their production tool as the recommended replacement mark for lateral wear. So with a, putting a fair amount of uh, pressure on my the lateral flex of my very hard life mountain bike chain there is pretty much dead on that uh, dot number five. So it's basically on the Abbey tool, uh, the LL tool that's coming out, dead on the replacement mark for lateral wear at the same time it has reached dead on the replacement wear mark for uh, elongation and with the new chain on um, yeah I can't notice any difference in the shifting uh, again it's, it's, it's axis so it's electronic shifting maybe it would be different if it's mechanical that uh, there might have been some very small improvement um, that you'd pick up easier if it was mechanical shifting but for sure on the electronic shifting I cannot detect in any way that the new chain shifts uh, any snappier it was shifting perfectly before um, when the chain reached 0.5 and it's shifting perfectly now with the new chain uh, with regards to shift ramp wear again you know I, th I think just running through some basic logic and numbers on that we can really put that one to bed as well uh, it's it's going to take a lot to convince me and i'd really need to see a lot of actual some you know objective information on this but you know at the end of the day what is going to cause shift ramp wear on your cassette or chain ring is going to be wear of the teeth period and wear of the teeth period comes from running a chain that is basically past its elongation mark so it starts to eat into those teeth if the chain that is running is uh, is you know within tolerance so it's, it's running under that 0.5% elongation wear mark generally speaking the wear to the cassette teeth and chain ring teeth is quite minimal there will be wear over time you can't get around the fact that uh, at the end of the day there are every ride hundreds of thousands of interactions between the roller and the teeth and that adds up obviously over not too many rides into millions and then over the lifespan of the chain hundreds of millions to depending on your riding behavior potentially billions so you know it's a lot of interactions between roller and teeth and eventually obviously those teeth are going to wear from those interactions uh, it is the wear on those teeth period that will determine whether or not you need to replace your cassette there are obviously a heck of a lot more interactions of roller to teeth uh, as there are to, I guess, interactions from shifting, putting load onto shift ramps. Even if you are shifting rather frenetically on average on your riding, if you're doing, say, three shifts per minute, uh, it might be more on in, in you know, a lot of mountain bike terrain. Road cycling is in general likely to average a lot less. But let's say three shifts per minute or a shift every 20 seconds for the entire duration of uh, every ride that you do. Um, and that number of shifts is obviously spread across shift, shift ramps on uh, you know, the range of the cogs that you're using. The actual number of, I guess, load cycles onto the shift ramps um, on your cassette teeth is is rather minuscule compared to the total number of you know wear load so cycles from the roller interacting with the teeth under your pedaling load um, I, I think you would you know you'd need to be shifting basically every pedal stroke um, your entire ride uh, 
to be trying to wear out the uh, the, the shift ramp load or the shift ramps on your teeth in line with um, the actual just general wear of your teeth from cycling. So wearing of the shift ramps from I guess just normal cycling behavior that's a, it's a tough one to to put that case forward. The only way you're going to wear your shift ramps again it is just wearing the teeth period. Uh, and let's have a little bit of a look at what that um, you know really means. Right, we can see here is a very worn cog. Um, now this tip to tip measure on pretty much all, or from what I've seen anyway, all Shimano and SRAM cassettes measuring from, I guess we'll just call it the trailing tip to a leading tip on the cassette teeth. Pick the squared teeth so you can see this tooth here is rounded that is a shift ramp tooth that has a profile to aid shifting don't try to measure to that because it is rather difficult to get the tip but from the tip to tip measure on the normal profile teeth when they are brand new it is 9.5 millimeters so now again as your uh, roller sits in here as it comes around, obviously, each time when you're putting uh, pedaling load, there is going to be some wear of uh, those teeth over time. Now, generally, when the uh, chain is you know, within, the, I guess, the recommended elongation wear, you know, these rollers are slotting in neatly in between the teeth. And by the time your rider load is really introduced, the roller is just pressing directly into the tooth face. And just... Uh, you know, not precisely correct, but but more or less, when the chain is elongation worn uh, past that 0.5%, what is really starting to happen is the roller is starting to hit the tip of the teeth and slide down uh, the tooth face to uh, settle in. And so as you get that chain worn longer and longer, it is just going to start to you know eat into these teeth to suit its new uh, increased length between the links. And the longer you wear your chain, it just yeah eats out the teeth to match it. So you can just do so much more damage running your chains past that uh, the, the general recommended 0.5%. So now, um, rough numbers. For most people, and again, there's a lot of exceptions to these general rules, but for most people, when they buy a new chain, if the tip-to-tip -tip measure is, say, 9.7 millimeters you know, often even 9.8 millimeters or less then a new chain typically goes on perfectly well uh, you can't notice that it's a it's a rough or not perfect mesh when you're pedaling uh, there's no jumping under power all is groovy for the more powerful riders once they start to get above sort of that 9.8 millimeter mark then they can expect that it may feel a bit rough under power and it may even jump under very high power. So sprints, attacks, that sort of stuff. Once we start getting to that sort of 9.9, 10 millimeter mark, then at the end of the day, that just starts to occur at ever lower power numbers <clears throat> until really by about sort of 10 millimeter, sorry, 10 millimeters plus, most cyclists are going to notice that the chain mesh is just quite crap. Like it feels rough. It doesn't feel smooth when you put the new chain on and you know, doing sort of even maybe 400 watts uh, of power it starts to jump under that load and really by you know once where it gets quite excessive like anything like here like 10.3 so really what we've seen with sort of even like 10.2 plus really nobody's getting away with a new chain uh, onto that level of wear uh, and having an okay time so this used to be a check that we do every time when a bike came in and needed a new chain I could give the customer a very good indication as to I guess what our chances are on the new chain going on with zero issues they may notice some issues or we are for sure having issues and we're going to need a new cassette and depending on the chainring tooth profile we could sort of do the same for chain rings as well but there's a lot more variance in chainring teeth profiles than there is a cassette right so what is going to wear your tooth profiles is wearing your teeth period so if you eat through these teeth then you are eating into your shift profiles and nothing really is going to go great Ooh, that was not a good line if 
you have, like I have done, run a wax chain to 15,000 kilometers to 0.5% wear mark, and the wear of this, uh, you know, this tip to tip is still around sort of 9.7 millimeters or less, or 9.8 uh, millimeters, also in a lot of cases, or less. You put a new chain on, you are golden. That it's still within enough uh, tolerance that you know, everything's running smooth, there is no jumping under load, and shifting is still perfect. So, yeah, it's just, I guess, all on, because I did have especially sort of one mechanic put on saying that they were surprised that I uh, disagreed with the, the whole shift ramp wear thing from, uh, from you know, putting a new chain on to uh, a previous cassette. It really depends on the cassette wear overall. And that if the cassette wear overall has been protected uh, because you have not run a chain for too long, then that's going to be the you know determine whether or not the next new chain still shifts perfectly or not. So there is not, I guess, what we'll call shift ramp wear as such from your normal riding behaviour. There is just teeth wear, uh, and that teeth wear comes from most times really how elongation worn your chain is and how long you have run that chain worn. Now, it's, it's, it is a little bit messy, this area, just from the fact that different cassettes are made from very, I guess, hardier or less hardy uh, metals that hold up or not to wear. So, stereotypically, all steel cassettes hold up to wear very well. And that if you replace your chain by 0.5%, you have an extremely good chance of getting a, another chain onto that cassette, no problems. Um, and in some cases people are going three chains to a cassette and having a pretty astounding lifespan out of their cassette. Some cassettes, so this for instance is uh, the cogs on a Durace um, cassette, the top six cogs or the largest six cogs on a Durace cassette are much much softer than the smaller five steel cogs, this is um, often 11 speed, and so even running one chain to 0.5% typically that cassette is toast. You typically will only get one Durace cassette to a chain even if you only run the chain to 0.5% because those soft cogs just simply wear. Um, there's not enough data, I don't have enough uh, data from people with regards to, you know, say SRAM Red versus Force and all that sort of stuff. We know a lot more about sort of Durace versus Ultegra and there's just a whole bunch to be discovered in the mountain bike world because again, different brand cassette materials does vary quite a lot from, you know, if we take say the SRAM Eagle cassettes, the, um, I guess the smaller 11 cogs, and obviously the 11 cogs still pretty big, but those smaller 11 cogs are made of tool steel. They are extremely wear resistant, whereas the largest cog is made of alloy and whilst not necessarily soft, so to speak, it is nowhere near as hardy as the other 11 steel cogs and so people that run their largest cog on their SRAM uh, Eagle X01 or XX1 cassettes find that when they put a new chain on they may need to throw away a magnificent and expensive cassette where 11 tool steel cogs are just still in mint condition but one alloy cog is chewed out and unless they just plan to avoid using that cog forever on their next new chain they have to get a new cassette. So, so just to wrap that, the summary of all that is that um, you know the number of kilometers you get on your say magnificent wax chain to 0.5%, that is not going to have an impact on shift ramp wear. You are not going to wear your shift ramps from shifting. It doesn't matter really how much you shift, um, just simply the number of load cycles going into shift ramps from shifting and also you can generally expect that they are going to be a much lower load than your pedaling load. Uh, it's just such a tiny, tiny number versus the total number of wear interactions from the rollers to the teeth from your, you know, your chain running through the teeth to propel you forwards. What is going to impact your shift ramp wear is teeth wear and how your teeth are by the time you have um, brought your chain to 0.5% in however many kilometers that may be. That's going to determine whether or not you need a new cassette with your chain. So a blanket statement around you can't, um, there's no point say getting an immersive wax chain to 15,000 kilometers or 9,000 miles 
um, to 0.5% elongation wear that that's pointless because your shift ramps will be worn anyway. It's just simply not a true statement. You can check the measure of your or, or the wear of your uh, cassette teeth and that will be the determinant as to whether or not that cassette is hardy and you can get another chain on no problems whatsoever or if you know the cassette needs replacing because those teeth have worn uh, past where they really will accept a new chain happily anyway. So I hope that all kind of makes sense. So it's it's a big varied world out there, but the blanket statement of there's no point getting these awesome lifespans out of your um, chain due to running a top lubricant, uh, you're going to need to replace all this other stuff regardless, simply uh, is not the case. Uh, with regards to chain rings, uh, again, there's just a whole bunch of variants. I don't want to get too messy on that. Chain ring, it's, it's a bit different. Uh, road bike, obviously, you've got generally two of them. They're large, so they tend to be able to spread that wear out across uh, you know, more teeth over time, even though you're using them, say, more constantly than you might do a single cog at the back. General rule of thumb is you should be able to get you know, at least three to four chains to a set of chain rings um, if you're replacing your chain at that recommended replacement mark. But again, this is, this is highly variable. Chain ring material also varies quite a lot, and so how they hold up to uh, to wear, um, how much do you use one ring versus another, you know, all that sort of stuff. Mountain bike, it can be, I guess, the opposite. Um, you've got one ring. It's typically, you know, going to be somewhere around 28 to 34 teeth, so it's a relatively small ring. And so you're just hammering that all the time and you're spreading all the other wear in your cassette across uh, quite a range of cogs. So it is not uncommon in the mountain bike world that even if your cassette is fine uh, for a new chain, that your chain ring isn't. That was the case for me personally when I uh, wore that other chain to 0.5 and uh, put a new chain on cassette, perfect chain ring. It was rough. So it just rough and rumbly and... Yeah, the, the tooth profile, again, you can't do an easy measure because it's narrow wide and it's quite a tall tooth profile for retention. So I don't have that baseline measure, but simply the feel, it's like, this is not going well. Haven't got away with a new uh, chain on the chain ring. And so I just put a new chain ring on and silk perfectness uh, at all ends then for my new chain. On my oldest um, road bike that I have, so I have um, Praxis... Um, works chain rings on that and had seen three chains uh, to basically 5,000 kilometers when I was still running a wet drip lube in my early days. Uh, it then saw a wax chain to 15,000 kilometers. Uh, so that takes us up to 30. It then uh, saw another chain for almost 15,000 kilometers, taking things up to almost 45,000. Uh, the next new chain was still perfect on the chain rings. Uh, it was still perfectly smooth and it still shifted perfectly uh, fine. Like it's brilliant shifting as DI2, so it's it still rides like the day I bought it. Uh, I changed the large chain ring only, uh, only because I wanted to try a Pyramid Cycle Designs 54 tooth on it. Um, I didn't need to change the uh, the chain ring uh, due to wear. Uh, the chain ring teeth profile on the Praxis Works uh, is pretty much in line with the cassette, so the chain ring teeth were uh, on that sixth chain, just getting to that 9.8 millimeter mark. So. If I hadn't gone to the uh, Pyramid Cycle Design chain ring, I was likely to move to a new set of rings on my uh, sixth chain, um, but that would have yeah, been at around 60,000 kilometers. So again, I, I would caution in general, especially for road, that you would need to change your chain rings um, you know, when you put a new chain on, again, because of things say like shift ramp wear, stuff like that. Ah, sorry, correction, it would have been, sorry, the seventh chain that I would have looked to just yeah, get a new set of rings on. It was already on the sixth, and that sixth chain uh, was, yeah, all groovy. And I just changed to uh, the larger one for fun experimenting. And again, this is where I guess the advantage of running the top lubricants also really helps with that outstanding component longevity. If a lubricant is great at protecting your chain from wear, it is also great at helping to protect your uh, teeth from wear. Um, we'll just have another quick look. So I know I've gone on this a bit, but while we're here. Okay, so fun fact, your chain's rollers do not actually roll really at all. 
As soon as the roller comes into contact with the uh, either the cassette teeth or the chainring teeth under oh my goodness I cannot draw under any actual load, they are held static. They are basically there to be a more or less static point against the teeth, so that the parts inside the chain can articulate. Because of obviously, if, if you uh, if the rollers were um, I guess fused to the uh, inner link plates like uh, a company called Teo did with their rollerless chain. Any settling motion and, and rotation uh, as the link wants to, to articulate is going to be doing so on the tooth face and that's going to eat that out really quickly because you've got then a lot of movement on the tooth face under load. So the roller is there for the inner link plate to be able to um, articulate inside that roller ball and the roller bore remains held static against the tooth face so that there is as really little wear as possible. So now there is still going to be a very, very small amount of movement of the roller on the tooth face as it really settles in um, as your load comes into play. Now if there is good lubrication uh, and really, in theory, you don't actually really need any lubrication between the roller and the tooth uh, face at all. But as long as there's either, say, no lubrication there, not causing any problems, or um, there's a little bit of protective uh, lubricant coating there, everything is grand. Once there starts to be, so, and this is more prevalent in you know, the mountain bike world and why you may often only get one chain ring per chain, even replacing the chain when you should. In the mountain bike world, you're often getting a lot of dust just come into play. So you, you don't necessarily have a lubricant or even just the, the bare metal, which again, in this case is fine because think there's not really uh, that movement there. If you have abrasive dust particles mashing between the roller and the tooth face, again, just that tiny bit of movement that occurs between the roller and the tooth face with abrasive dust in between it, Again, over tens of millions, hundreds of millions of interactions, it just it, it will cause wear. Um, so that's really, I guess, why you can't run chain rings forever, even if you replaced um, you know your chains very very frequently. But it is also why um, a little bit of build up with your top immersive waxes or top wax strips, which form a little bit of a wax coating. Uh, even though it's, it can be very thin on the tooth face, that is actually wear protective. Uh, in road cycling, obviously a little bit of a film from a, a good wet lubricant um, is going to be similarly wear protective. The issue that really occurs with all wet lubricants is that there's not really a way over time to stop those wet lubricants from becoming abrasive from you know airborne dust. Um, and you just don't want something that's abrasive uh, in here. Uh, obviously just airborne dust just doesn't stick to solid waxes uh, like it does to wet lubricants so it just they just don't become abrasive at you know anywhere remotely near the, the rate that a wet lubricant does but again on road a top wet lubricant especially with uh, just some basic periodic maintenance you keep things amazing but <clears throat> Again, one of the advantages of immersive waxing and the top uh, wax strips is uh, the wear protection that um, that the, the wax coatings can give to teeth. Uh, that really, really helps with a lot of, say, expensive road chain rings where, again, like my previous example, you should be getting many chains to your chain rings, especially if you're replacing your chains when you should. You likely won't get away with it on mount, like a single ring mountain bike, however, but it gives you the best chance. All right, so I think that's been a <laughs> over detailed chat again of just to really cover off number of chains to cassettes and chain rings. And yes, there's going to be a lot of real world variants to that. But what's your stereotypes and, uh, and you know, uh, how things should go and how that all relates to your great elongation wear lifespans versus wear of shift ramps. And I, I don't know, I hope I've, um, covered it in enough detail to um, to support, I guess, the correction of sort of putting forward with regards to um, the, the point made that there's no point getting great uh, wear lifespan 
because your ladder aware of chain and shift ramp wear will negate that benefit and you're going to have to replace the parts uh, anyway. Very lastly, so yeah, after all this uh, mega three part sort of correction and clarification, I just want to say, look, you know, uh, apologies to Escape Collective if it came across a bit harsh or sort of shooting down. I don't know really any other way to do these corrections rather than just really. I guess put my points across uh, as I guess best supported as I can against points that I uh, you know disagree with or that I really feel have been objectively proven uh, now to sort of not be correct. Um, you know I want everybody to be having the best lifespan from their lovely drivetrain components as they can. There are just so much better things to spend your money on as opposed to having to purchase another potentially very expensive cassette and or set of chain rings. Yet again, due to um, you know running a poor lubricant choice, immersive waxing is not for everybody, but it really, really suits a surprising number of people. And for those people to weigh up if immersive waxing is a, uh, a good option for them to consider, I just think it really helps if they have the correct information uh, about you know the ins and outs of immersive waxing. And not have um, you know what I think in my view are very sort of incorrect stereotype information about immersive waxing you read just the huge amount of time and faff and not much benefit and that sort of stuff. So just wanted to really, I guess, yeah, do the best I can to sort of clarify why I spend probably what the last uh, two hours of video time across the last week sort of just correcting uh that that fairly sort of small segment on a uh, on a geek warning podcast and that really you know like I, I love escape collective for just all the best reasons they are just such a great um you know media publication in cycling to support they just have such great integrity of uh, you know and depth of their journalism and their talents from tech to investigative journalism on so many different topics you know race coverage just you name it um I think they are fantastic and should be supported. So if you're not an Escape Collective member, uh, I think you should consider, um, you know, joining up because we want publications like Escape to uh, to come around. Oh, sorry, to keep uh, being around. Yeah, and also I guess a little reminder that for a long time, you know, Dave uh, in in the previous place in our Escape, you know, he's been one of the best advocates for you know immersive waxing and you know and or top wax strips for a very long time um and he's done i guess probably the best job out of any journalist that i've seen in the world of cycling with regards to getting out the detail information with big big articles on you know best chain loops and chain maintenance and so on that have helped get immersive waxing out to the masses extremely well you know his reach is much greater than mine so you know Dave has done an outstanding job in this space overall, uh, and it's not, you know, in a, in a geek warning or just on a on a podcast on the spot. If you've got a differing opinion, uh, it's not going to always be the easiest thing to just go into a one hour debate um, to, to counterpoint that. So that's that's where I'm going to come in after the fact and 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 go through it all. So yeah, so just taking everything into uh, balance. Uh, please don't let this whole thing shine any negative light whatsoever on Escape. Uh, I really only want positive lights uh, and support for Escape Collective. All right, I've used up just about all my time not on the main topic. Uh, so it's going to be not much time on the main topic today. However, all of that lead up actually sort of segues in perfectly to uh, what is probably the craziest sentence or information I have ever read in this space uh, with regards to uh, chain wear and component wear. Uh, so thank you to a long-term uh, follower, uh, Dawn Rider, for highlighting this one to me. So I'm going to cover it probably just yeah, not much, uh, too much depth today. I'm sort of reaching out to try to get some more information from SRAM so that we can discuss it a bit deeper uh, on an upcoming video. But uh, yeah, while we're here and going into all this stuff with regards to elongation wear, when should you replace your chain and how does that sort of relate to lifespan of your cassette and chain rings? Oh, let's have a look at this from Strahan that kind of, uh, yeah, puts all of what I've just covered into a rather interesting light. Okay, let's have a step off the logic deep end here. When should the chain on my SRAM red axis group set be replaced? Now this is on the official SRAM uh, support website 
flat top chains last longer than 10 slash 11 speed road chains and should be replaced when they measure 0.8% on an approved chain checker. Now, this is the best part. Replacing a flat top chain too early may prematurely wear the chain ring and cassette. I'm just going to read that last sentence again because it is absolutely batshit crazy. Replacing a flat top chain too early may prematurely wear the chain ring and cassette. Yeah, so when Dawn Ryder first sent me that, like, I, I could not believe that that was actually uh, on the, the SRAM official uh, site. I thought that this must just be some wacky thing from uh, a Reddit forum or something like that. But um, it was, yeah, it's actually the, the SRAM official <laughs> information and uh, a few logic circuits in my brain tripped and I went into a slight coma for a while, curled up on the floor. Then I recovered and uh, after uh, about a day, I started to sort of, I think, understand what might be going on there. So obviously I need to talk to SRAM and I'm trying to get the right contact uh, at SRAM with regards to chains and drivetrains. Uh, but here is my best theory as to what that is supposed to mean. Um, you may have also heard, I think it was on um, previous week's uh, Geek Warning on Escape, that uh, Dave was mentioning that he'd, he'd heard, um, I guess, you know, the anecdotal word on the street from um, the world of SRAM cycling is that the hard chrome treatment on a lot of their chains, so their higher level chains in uh, road and mountain bike, the, the hard chrome treatment, which really is industry leading by a pretty decent margin as best as, uh, as I can tell as well, making the chains extremely, uh, I guess, hard wearing with regards to their elongation wear life, that by the time someone is wearing their chain to the recommended replacement mark, the cassettes and chain rings are worn such that they need to be replaced anyway. So it's kind of a bit of a new frontier uh, in that you know they've just made such incredibly hardy chains that, that this is really starting to occur. So, you know, we have to put into, I, I guess, account from the start that replacing your chains early, so replacing your chains um, before they are very, you know, elongation worn, cannot cannot cause premature wear to your cassette and your chain rings i mean when you buy a new sram group set they don't ship it with a worn chain because a new chain would cause some uh, premature wear to your lovely new cassette and chain rings i mean that's that sentence is probably the the wackiest illogical sentence i've i've could ever imagine coming across in this space Obviously, World Tour Pro teams that are replacing their chains typically every sort of 500 to 1,000 kilometers, they are not putting on new SRAM red cassettes and, and chain rings. When they do that, they are pumping a lot of chains through. Uh, they get, you know, can often get seasons out of their cassettes because they're replacing their chains so often. The chain is the consumable part in the equation. Uh, it is meant to be the consumable part in the equation. So what I think is happening is that because of the hardiness of the, uh, the you know the, the high level SRAM chains for both road and mountain bike that if you were to replace it by the normal 0.5% and I'll come back to SRAM 0.8 in a, in a bit um, but replacing them at the 0.5% it could be that by the time they've got to that mark that there is sufficient wear to the cassette and potentially chain rings as well that a new chain is just not playing uh, it is running rough and or might be starting to jump under load as we sort of covered before. So therefore, in, you know, in SRAM's opinion that it's like, hey, look, just to get better lifespan and better economies uh, out of running your drivetrain, run it longer, run it to 0.8, not 0.5, and then replace basically the lot. So, you know, that's why, I mean, 0.5% recommended wear replacement mark has been the, uh, I guess, the standard for a very long time. In the early days, so really the five to eight speed, because the chains were in, had, a, had a wider internal width and therefore the teeth had, you know, they were also thicker, so they're a bit more metal there, they were more resistant to wear. Treatments on those five to eight speed chains were not amazing with regards to longevity, so you would typically get a chain worn up to say 0.5% quite quickly. It's just a lower number of total interactions uh, onto the uh, cassette teeth and chain ring teeth to, to eat them out so that 
if you replace the chain by say 0.75, you would often get a new chain onto your existing cassette and chain ring teeth okay. With the modern, uh, so from nine speed onwards, we went to a thinner internal width chain. The cassette and chain ring teeth are you know, obviously thinner to match that internal width, so there's less metal thickness there. And a lot of the chains are much harder wearing because of better uh, metal quality, better treatments on the on the chains. You know, and a, a typically an eleven a quality eleven speed chain is much longer lasting than a uh, eight speed chain. So it's a lot more interactions to get a chain even zero point five percent as opposed to uh, say an eight speed chain to zero point seven five. In short, you just really couldn't get away with running chains to zero point seven five percent and have a you know much chance of getting the next new chain on uh, your existing cassette. Uh, whereas at 0.5%, you know, for a lot of cassettes, especially if they're steel, that is going to be more the norm than not, as I covered in depth before. So SRAM going to 0.8% is obviously quite a departure from what has been the new recommendation for a very long time now, uh, and why most tools now, um, you know, probably at least 90% of all new tools that have come to the market in the last probably decade have a 0.5% as their first wear mark, not 0.75%. So I think that the the SRAM uh, the the official SRAM tool uh, for the Axis systems going to a zero point eight percent wear mark is in line with the fact that they want you to run things out longer and get more overall lifespan than if you use zero point five percent and still had issue with uh, a new chain on your existing cassette and or chain rings. And so look, if that's the case, then at the end of the day, I can understand that logic and I can understand that recommendation. It's still not what I would do. And I'll tell you, I guess, what my recommendation would be. But my recommendation, I can see how that would be tricky for SRAM to be able to explain without it being misunderstood and uh, miscontextualized uh, quite badly. So, you know, I get the whole run it out to 0.8%. Um, and then replace, you know, your cassette and potentially chain rings. Still, I mean, that's still not great. That can be a bloody big bill for a lot of, uh, you know, higher level SRAM group sets. But obviously, that does not explain uh, in any way the statement of replacing your chains early can, can cause premature wear. Um, so that is still... Uh, in my opinion, unless SRAM can really come back to me with something on this, an absolute just Mount Everest pile of horseshit. So, yeah, I'm really wanting to uh, to get a hold of someone and, and have a good chat about all that. My personal recommendation um, would be a, a, a couple. So rather than run a chain out to point eight and have to replace everything, I would much rather from the gun run say two chains on uh, on rotation and replace them at 0 0.5 you're still going to get overall much longer wear life doing that uh, as opposed to uh, running one chain out to 0 0.8 it may sound like it's only 0.2 difference but you know chain wear is often not linear especially in um, just drip lube only and depending on your flush clean maintenance the abrasiveness of the lubricant in your chain will increase over time um, so the wear rates increase over time and also the, the wear protections on the chains at some point start to become compromised because they're just platings at the end of the day. So once the plating is gone, then that wear protection is gone and there can be a significant ramp up in chain wear rates. So you would expect that say two chains on rotation to 0 0.5, um, you know, with a good lubricant and just you know, decent periodic maintenance, you're going to have a really good time and that's going to be a noticeable bit longer than running one chain to 0 0.8. You could obviously look to try to run two to 0 0.8. It is possible that due to the hardiness of the chains and how long that may be, that the cassette wear uh, you know, could be starting to get uh, significant by that point potentially. So, yeah, but again, depending on the cost of your group sets, it might be worth a shot. The other option would be to look to replace the chains early. So look to replace them at 0 0.2, 0 0.3 max, and ensure you get the next chain on without any issue. Uh, and you're likely to be able to get, say, you're going to be able to get, I would imagine, at least the two or three chains to that uh, point if you're doing it at, at 0.2 to 0.3. Not many chain wear checkers will accurately you know, give you that reading. So the again, the new Abbey Tools Checker is one on the market that has a 0 0.2 measure. 
that could be uber handy if you're running SRAM, RED, Axis, or uh, T-Type, uh, things like that. So I now have T-Type uh, XXSL um, upgraded onto my main race mountain bike. I don't ride that enough training volume because I mostly uh, train on the uh, on the old one to warrant two training chains. If that was my only mountain bike and that was my main training bike, I would have two chains on rotation. Being that I don't ride it that much, I have a training chain and a race chain for it, then you know I will just keep an eye on it and I will replace that chain at 0 0.2 uh, or very close to that mark. And I feel extremely confident I will get the next new chain on no issue whatsoever. Um, you know, if I did encounter an issue, let's say I ran the chain to 0.2 or 0.3, put the new chain on and it's running rough um, because the the wear to the cassette teeth well i'm going back to my old chain and i'm taking that to 0.8 um, so but i i highly doubt that's going to be the case i think i'm going to be able to get at least the two potentially three uh, chains if i replace them at 0.2 to 0.3 and have a much better time and i'm not running a chain out to 0.8 like running the chains out to 0.8 so really from that 0.5 to 0.8 mark you know you are going to start to cause obviously accelerated wear to your cassette teeth and chain ring teeth and eating through metal. Uh, it's just not low friction compared to not eating through metal. Lateral wear could obviously start to become more of an issue. So there may be some degradation noticed in that 0.5 to 0.8. Um, you know, maybe not, but it obviously a higher risk, especially if you're in a demographic that's riding on the climbing gears and high chain line angles out in the world of dirt and dust, you know, quite a bit. So, you know, generally running to 0 0.8 um, may have some sort of little negatives versus uh, replacing chains early because you're always keeping things crisp and tight and, uh, and not going to a state where you're sort of actively wearing through your uh, teeth at a faster rate. You know, however, for SRAM to, I guess, take that path, which, you know, I feel very strongly that that is a better path, uh, erring on replacing your chains early or uh, obviously running two in rotation. It's not an easy sell if you're the SRAM marketing department. Could quite easily be, uh, you know, seen by the market. It's like pff, SRAM chains, you can only run them to say 40 to 60% of the wear rate versus basically every other brand chain. You know, that's, that's pretty well madness. So I can, you know, understand why they can't put out, say, the same recommendation path as what I've just pitched to you there. And I can understand why, you know, they're, they're going down a path uh, and have brought out their own tool to 0.8%. But, uh, you know, there is, to me, still no defense to say that replacing chains early will cause premature wear. It is simply that if you replace your chain, say, before they're recommended 0.8, and especially if that is around that 0.5% uh, mark, there's a potential that your new chain is not going to play with your existing cassette, uh, potentially leading people to have to replace the, the cassette and possibly also chain rings earlier than what they would have if they ran the chain out to 0 0.8. So that's what I believe they're saying, but they haven't said that well with that latter sentence at all because that that later sentence is a, just, yeah, obviously impossible. I would love, I, I can't wait to see if SRAM can actually explain to me how uh, going to a new chain early causes premature wear, that will be something. I had a bit of a chat with Dave Rome from Escape to Collective, and uh, this is a sentence that he got back from SRAM, so credit to Escape uh, for this information. SRAM uh, replied that, Replacing the chain prematurely with the intent to prolong the overall drivetrain life is unnecessary, is less economical, and it does not reduce total system wear rate appreciably. So that's an interesting kind of take. Right, so, I mean, if I compare that to, say, a, a stereotypical previous situation with, say, Shimano Altegra, I get a chain to 15,000 kilometers on my immersive waxing, and I put a new chain on, and I get another chain to 15,000 kilometers on immersive waxing. I've got another 15,000 kilometers out of my uh, cassette. That is more economical than if, for instance, I ran the chain to 0 0.8, maybe took the cassette to 20,000 kilometers, but then needed a new cassette when I purchased my new chain. 
Now, I don't have um, the same sort of easy comparison numbers um, with SRAM because uh, you know, the hardiness of the hard chrome chains versus how hardy are, say, a SRAM Force cassette versus a RED cassette or an Eagle XX1 versus a GX. Don't have that to be able to say, hey, if you run a chain 2.5, you're going to get a next new chain on really without any, any concern on that particular model cassette and it's clearly going to be more economical. However, uh, I'd still fairly strongly contest the, I guess, that sentence by SRAM that there's no point to, um, you know, from an economics perspective. I think it is, in most cases, going to be more often and more likely the most economical path. So, yeah, I mean, even just looking at the, the basic case of for those that are using drip lubricants only, um, again, almost always the, the latter half of the chain wear rate is going to be more rapid than the the first half so going early keeping chain wear uh, lower for longer by the fact that the chain still has its uh, protections in place and the lubricant uh, versus abrasiveness ratio is going to be generally lesser um, so that is in its uh, sort of corner to begin with even if it worked out though and, and it, i don't really don't think that it would but even if it worked out that there was no economic benefit um, to replace your chains earlier and get multiple chains in to the same total kilometers before you have to replace your cassette and chain rings it's going to be more pleasurable running um, by the time you're running your chain out from say 0.5 to 0.8 as i mentioned before you are going to be starting to eat through those teeth at a faster rate and eating through your metal teeth is less uh, or not as low friction running and there's more potential for things like, you know, lateral wear starting to impact shift performance coming into play, you know, all that stuff. So it's just, it's going to be a lesser experience. It's going to be crapper running, running your chain from 0.5 to 0.8 uh, than it's going to be replacing chains earlier, even if that has to be, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 to ensure you're getting the next new chain on without having issues. So that would, you know, if I was me, definitely be what I would be doing. You know, uh, you could you could pretty well be assured that if you were to go to any sort of world tour or decent level um, professional racing, anyone running SRAM, be it road or mountain bike, you know, then they're not rocking up to their next important race with a chain that's at 0.8% wear or 0.7 or point, even 0.5. Uh, you're going to find basically a new chain and you will find that they have put many new chains onto the same um, set of uh, chain rings and cassette. And for a lot of very good reasons with regards to lower friction and uh, everything running rather beautifully. All right, so to wrap up this little one today, I hope to revisit this uh, soon if I can get some information from SRAM that uh, that I can actually uh, yeah, have new information to discuss or what their responses are. But definitely yeah, contest that there's no uh, economical benefit to um, erring on replacing your chains earlier, especially earlier than the 0.8. And that for sure there should be some uh, drivetrain running benefits to doing so. The sentence that you know um, that yeah, put, replacing chains prematurely causes wear. Yeah, you know, obviously I can't wait to have a chat to the right person at SRAM about that one and update accordingly. All right, that better be me. Thank you for watching this one. Sorry, I was even more uh, rushed than normal, so my wording will be potentially more terrible and it ran on longer but there we go um yeah so thanks as always look forward to your comments and input and questions and i will rip into those as best i can over the weekend and early next week have a great weekend everyone stay safe stay low friction keep enjoying the tour de france spin a belter and i think there's another f1 on this weekend i can't even remember i've got to look it up everything's been a blur all right catch you maybe next week <laughs>